Yeah, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much to Switzer for having us here today, and thanks for your time. Um, my name's Stephen Bruce. I'm the Portfolio Manager for the eInvest Income Generator Fund. And just quickly what our fund is, it's an actively managed ETF, so it's a listed, a listed fund, but unlike a listed investment company, it always trades at net asset value. And what it aims to do is to provide an attractive growing income stream for those investors who are investing in the equities market focused on income, and we pay monthly distributions with a target yield of 7% per annum. Now, um, the, the fund la was launched in May last year, so it's coming up for its, its first year in, in operation, but it's actually based on a, a fund called the Perennial Value Shares for Income Trust, which I also run, which we've been running since December 2005. So the underlying fund on which it's modelled has a 13-year track record and has paid a pre-tax distribution yield of 7.9% per annum over that period. So it's a proven product put into a new convenient structure. So today I'm going to talk about portfolio positioning in the, in the current political environment. And when I was thinking about this, it's actually very, very interesting because I think what, I, what supersedes the political environment is really the strength and the fundamental soundness of the Australian economy. Now, it's been an interesting day for me because I've just been sitting here watching, watching Graham Richardson speak and we've actually been doing a roadshow for, for some of our other investors. And so this morning I was presenting to our investors at the Western Hotel in the ballroom, and the speaker we've engaged for our roadshow was Alexander Downer. So he, so I've basically had Liberal and Labor royalty on, on both sides of me this morning, which I guess is one of, the, one of the good things about this sort of job. But he, anyway, he painted a picture. He painted a picture of how strange it is. You know, he's just come back from his term as High Commissioner to, to the, the United Kingdom after, after his 12 years as Foreign Minister. And he painted a picture of this strange situation we're in where the world is in a better position than it's ever been in history in, in a material sense. But at the same time, we're all aware of these political and economic risks. And there's this general sense of discontent and anxiety about the future. You know, and, um, but so this is where I want to take a step back and just look at the, the Australian economy in general and the Australian stock market in particular. Then I'll talk about some of the valuations we're seeing in the, in the market at the moment and we know that in the long run it's valuation that is critical for return. And then I'll talk about dividends and, and, and touch on the franking credit issue, although that's really been done, done pretty comprehensively so far. So really, um, when we think about the world out there, there's definitely a lot to worry about if you want to. We've got erratic and unconventional leadership. We're seeing the breakdown of institutions that have underpinned decades of post-war peace and prosperity. We're seeing rising trade tensions and a pushback against globalization. And we're also seeing the uncertainty caused by the recent decline in house prices here. Although I, I find it amusing now, I mean, it seems like only yesterday the biggest concern in society was the housing affordability crisis. Now, 12 months later, we've, we've, we're concerned about the opposite. And then, you know, when we get closer to home, there are plenty of people who think that this is the biggest, the biggest risk of all. So with that, that backdrop, you know, it's sort of, you, can, you can sort of really find a lot to worry about, but one of the good things about my job, as I said, you get to meet all sorts of interesting people, and last year I got to meet Sir John Scarlett. Now, Sir John Scarlett, which is an interesting name, he was head of MI6 from 2004 to 2009, and before that he was the chairman of the Joint Intelligence, Cabinet Joint Intelligence Committee, and before that he was chief of staff, or head of station in Moscow during the Cold War. So there's a guy who's seen a lot of stuff go on in the world, and I said, so John, it seems there's a lot to worry about and there's a lot of bad things in the world. And he said, my dear boy, when you've had my job, you realise there's always a lot of bad stuff to worry about, but you just don't see it and usually nothing comes of it. So on to that basis, you know, maybe we, we can relax a little bit. Um, but so looking at the Australian economy, you know, it, it's such a fabulous economy and we all know about the, the record-breaking streak of economic growth that we've had, 28 years of unbroken growth. Now, my, that was attributable to the mining boom on the, uh, that, that saved us after the GFC, but really, you know, it, it has been the benefit of decades of reform-minded, centrist governments of both persuasions that have given us an open and flexible economy and generally soundly managed the, soundly managed the government balance sheet. And when you look at where we stand today, net debt to GDP, government level, sub 20%, you know, compared to the other developed countries, we're in a fabulous position. Average is 74%. We're eight countries in the world which have a AAA credit rating, and we're one of them. So we're in a very strong financial position. 
Now, we all talk about resources as underpinning the economy, and obviously resources are very important, and fortunately resources continue to be strong. But we do have a range of other globally significant industries. You know, we're, one of the, we're, the third, we're the third biggest provider of international education, with 7% of the global market. We're the seventh biggest destination for international tourism. We're the 12th biggest agricultural exporter. And as we all know, there's this very large financial services sector with the sixth largest saving pool globally. So we've got a lot of good things going for us. And then you sort of look underneath that and you look at about, you know, what immigration has given us. You know, we've got a multilingual, culturally diverse workforce. 40% of the workforce are tertiary educated. We've got an education sector that's got the third highest number of universities in the top 100 globally anywhere. Um, and we produce 4% of the world's research, research papers. And we've got institutions like the CSIRO churning out seed ideas which can be commercialised. And many of the companies that we've invested in at E-Invest and Perennial um, are, are the beneficiaries of those technologies. And the CSIRO ranks in the top 1% of global scientific organisations in 14 of the 22 key fields of research. And when you put all that together, it's no wonder that Australia is an attractive destination for foreign inve investment. So when you look at direct and indirect investment in Australia, foreign investment in Australia, it's up to $3.5 trillion or twice GDP. And it's been growing at about 10% per annum for the last decade. And our mining gets about a third of it, but the other two thirds is, is, thirds is broadly diversified across a whole range of different industries um, and represents you know, the diversity of the underlying economy. Uh, people say Chinese are a big part of that, and they are. But when you look at the total stock of investment, only 5% of it is Chinese today. 20% of it is from the US, 10 from the UK, and 10 from Japan. So we're attracting interest from all over the world and will likely continue. One of the other things which gives us some confidence as well in that this is going to be and continue to be an attractive place for foreign investment and therefore driving growth is that as people start to focus more on ESG, you know, environmental, social and governance issues, Australia's with its rule of law and strong regulations and strong regulatory framework stands up really well. You know, are you going to buy, are you going to build a mine in the Congo or are you going to build it in Western Australia? If you're a CEO, there's a lot more things that can go wrong in the Congo than there can in the Pilbara. So you can leave the Congo to Glencore and other people will invest here. Um, so not only have we been an attractive destination for um, capital, we're an attractive destination for people. And you look over the last decade, the population's grown at 1.7% per annum, which puts us second only to Singapore in the developed nations. Now, population growth obviously drives nominal GDP. You know, there's more people buying food at the shops. It underpins demand for housing, clogs up the roads and everything too. But what it does is, it, on a longer-term view, and there are some amazing statistics. Like last year, I saw... Uh, Phil Lowe give a presentation about this, and he said, the last decade of high immigration that we've already had means that in 20 years' time from now, the median age in Australia will be 40, and if we hadn't had that, it would have been 46. So the median age today is 37. Sadly, I'm on the wrong side of that, but it's only going to be 40 rather than 46. And that's a huge shift in the demographic profile, and it means you have higher birth rates, high life expectancy, high fertility, and the age dependency ratio is lower. So a very strong underpinning, because we know that demographics are critically important to, to economic growth. So where, where's the growth going to come from in, in this economy, regardless of what government gets in on the 18th of May? Now, we know the economy transitioned really well from the mining boom to the housing boom. So what comes next as the housing boom, construction boom peaks? Well, the good news is other parts of the economy are picking up the slack. If we cycle back to resources, commodity prices are still strong, still strong, and the resource companies are coming off a very low period of constrained investment, and they're now starting to have to spend again. And you think just looking at BHP, Rio, and Fortescue are all spending around two to three billion each, starting today, building new mines in the Pilbara to repl replace old mines. They don't have any choice in this. So that's going to suck in labour. And what we saw just the other day is Perth house prices have actually started going up again in 80 of 240 sort of suburbs. So it's the beginning after a long sort of trough there. And then infrastructure, as you're walking down the street here, I mean, it's just incredible the amount of infrastructure being built. And the chart here shows the pipeline of infrastructure projects over the next five years that are currently, currently in the pipeline, let alone what might be announced by any, by any new government. And then you've got the shock absorber on the, on the economy of the Aussie dollar, which has already fallen from 80 to 70 over the last 18 months. And that obviously underpins your export-exposed industries or currency-exposed industries like tourism 
and, and, and our other exporters. And this is all related, this is why we've got 5% unemployment and no hint of employment starting to rise. So plenty of broad-based growth there. And then you combine that with, you know, whatever government gets in, you're either going to get tax cuts or more spending. Um, both of them will increase spending on infrastructure. And because the budget's in such a good position, almost back in surplus, if we do hit a pothole, there's plenty of scope for extra stimulus within the, within the parameters, and you've got interest rates still at one and a half, so you do have some scope to cut if need be, although we all hope that that doesn't need to be done. And we put that all together, it's not surprising that the IMF give Australia the rosiest growth outlook of any of the other areas over the next, over the next five years. So I hope I've painted a reasonably positive picture of the, back, the economic backdrop in Australia and why we think Australia will continue to be an attractive investment destination. And when we look at the performance of the market compared to other regions, going back over the last 25 odd years, Australia's been one of the best performing equities markets in the world. One, one of the criticisms of our market though is that it's very reliant on resources. But if we look at this chart here, we can see that only really 20% of the market is resources. And within that, you've got diversification from coal and iron ore and copper and LNG in particular, which is a new component. So it's not overly, not really overly reliant on resources at a market level. Then you've got a big financial services sector, that's the, the blue bar, which is 30%. Two thirds of that is banks. I can drone on for hours about banks being a bank analyst, but in summary, my view is that our banks will have horrible results this week. Now we'll cut its dividend a little bit probably, but they are sound and they'll continue to deliver over the medium term. So that leaves the rest of the market. And, and interestingly, when you look at the stocks in the market, the ASX is home to many, many world beating companies. And here's just a sample of companies which have forged global leadership positions across a range of industries. So when you're buying these companies, you're buying a global exposure. It doesn't matter what happens to the domestic economy because the bulk of their business is either driven by global factors or physically based, based offshore. Now, talking about valuations in the market, because as a value style investing firm, which is what we are, that's the number one thing that we always look at, the market's trading around 15 and a half times earnings, and that's not far above its long-term average. So overall, the market looks reasonable value to us. But when you break it down, the expensive stocks in the market are trading on really, really high levels, and the cheap stocks in the market are cheap, and that's a phenomenon that we've seen over the last three, five year, three to five years in the market in this free money environment where investors have just chased growth and momentum and been prepared to pay pretty much any price for it. And when, you know, I'm talking about some of the tech stock names in there that are on, on you know, 100 times earnings, et cetera, but also some, some bigger companies as well are trading on very ritzy multiples. But what you see in this chart is you know, ultimately the law of gravity catches up and when valuations get high, you do get mean reversion and usually when you least expect it and quite sharply. But the flip side of this is that the value part of the market, the cheap part of the market is really quite cheap. So this gap has grown, grown really wide. And that's happened at the same time though, that the actual earnings dispersion is in fact quite narrow. And this is a very busy slide, so I apologize, and I'll go, have to go fast because I'm running out of time. But what we're just trying to contrast here is a bunch of expensive stocks down the bottom in red, the sort of stocks we don't hold. Things like, you, know, you can read the names there, they're all good companies, but look, they're trading on about 28 times next year's earnings. And they're giving you, on average, about 10% earnings growth over the next three years. Now, this is consensus market forecasts, not mine, but, um, so there's no bias there. But by contrast, if you look at those stocks at the top, there are a bunch of stocks there which are giving you, well, actually 1% more growth according to the market, but trading on literally half the, half the multiple. So the important thing is there's a big valuation dispersion in the market and you have to pay attention to valuation in what you're buying. Now the other thing I'd note on this slide here, if you look at the right hand column where we talk about the dividend yield, a lot of these expensive stocks are paying next to nothing in dividends, you know, sub 3%. And while capital gains come and go with time, dividends are a far more reliable and a part, part of an investor's total return. And in fact, when you look at the, if I just jump forward a few things, a few slides here. When you look at the contribution that dividends, and this is dividends not including franking credits, just net dividends that they've made to total return over the long, over the long scope of time, you can see it's nearly half of the total return of the market comes in dividends. So that's, that's and to, to get, to get back, back to what the previous speakers were saying about the reliability of dividends and income is very important when, you, when you're um, putting together a portfolio. Um, so what do, we, what do we like in terms of the themes? Given that backdrop of a generally positive view, 
we do like the banks. They're not going to do much in capital growth. They may even go down a little bit, but we think the dividends are generally sustainable there or thereabouts at current levels. But we expect they'll focus on costs in a weak revenue environment. This is the results this week, and next will be a horrible mess of remediation charges and write-offs and things, but they're well capitalised. We do like the resources. We think commodity prices will continue to be firm. The balance sheets are de-geared. They continue to pay dividends. We like tourism as a theme, Tab Corp, Crown, Star, etc. We love Macquarie Bank. It is just a global champion, and the scope of the opportunity set for it is just phenomenal. Um, and that's so. I'll just I'll just leave that there. We've talked to death about about franking credits, but just one, one thing, the one the one sort of point I'll make is even if you take away franking credits from distribution from from dividend yields. Higher yielding stocks still stack up very, very well compared to other sorts of investments. Now, these are only sort of rough, rough average numbers, but we, if we look at the bank shares, roughly they're paying about 9.5% gross dividends, including franking credits. You take the franking credits away, they're still paying 67 Now, that stacks up you know, pretty well compared to hybrids or infrastructure stocks or REITs, and definitely very well compared to fixed income investments. So we think in that sort of spectrum of income-producing asset in your portfolio, High yielding shares currently can occupy a very useful position and would continue to do so even in the absence of, of franking credits. So and, and, and I think you know, Paul said, you know, this has to get through the Senate, which is looking quite high, high, highly unlikely. So, so just in conclusion, I'd just like to wrap and say the, the Australian economy has proved very resilient over a long period of time. Um, for, on the basis of the, you know, the strength of the institutions and structures here, and we don't see that changing regardless of an election outcome in a couple of weeks' time. We think the overall outlook, although it's more subdued than it has been, still remains positive, and that the ASX is a very attractive place to invest. Looking within the market, we think there's definitely more opportunity at the value end of the market than at the expensive end, and critical to, to all investing and to the running of the products we run, such as the e-invest income generator, is that dividends are an absolutely critical component of total return. Um, so with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Paul.